Um, yeah, so I haven't seen uh, female friendships depicted uh, quite like this. That, that felt the most um, reflective of my own friends and my own sort of, sort of my wife and her friends and stuff like that. I'm just wondering if it's quite frustrating for you how rarely it's got if it, it, it's right and, and and what you guys did to, to to make sure that this was really authentic and accurate. Mm. I think we didn't want to. We wanted to be careful to make it as complex as possible, and um, and I suppose that keeping that heart of the story was the the key thing for me in the adaptation process, because you have to work out what or I had to work out what I was precious about, what I was willing to let go and smash and lose, and what what had to absolutely stay there and was fundamental. And the thing that was fundamental, the main thing, aside from a few jokes, which I you know really wanted to get in there, it was the the female friendship and and the idea that that being as complex and as heartbreaking and as messy and it's not just kind of this perfect thing it's kind of it's quite often dark and awful giving it as much gravitas and as much complexity as a romantic relationship or a familial relationship felt so crucial because um i think that it, it's in the one of the scenes in in the movie i think it, it, it made it in with um where tyler's sort of talking about how there's milestones and markers in life for romantic relationships but not for friendships so you get engaged engaged you get married you know but where are the where are the equivalents in friendship for that and yet your friendships are often the most durable complex relationships of your life um, they outlive romantic relationships but there's nothing to kind of mark that and does that matter but but it was something i was very interested in exploring hmm. It's sometimes um, audience members say to me, like, um, well, I wasn't sure at first if they were lesbians. Like, I really thought mm -hmm. they were together. And my experience of um, female friendships, particularly at that age, was that people do feel like that about you. Like, they watch you and think that the kind of connection that you have, that, that deep kind of physical connection, must be a romantic thing or must be a sexual thing. But it feels like very strongly mm -hmm. part of the authenticity of, of being uh, female friends with someone, particularly mm -hmm. at a time where you're not necessarily in a long-term romantic relationship, mm -hmm. I think. Yeah. But if you've been living together and sharing everything and then one of you meets someone and they're going to go and be with them instead, that's heartbreaking. I kind of, I feel like that's something that so many people I know have experienced and just, and I haven't seen that um, and I hadn't read about that, so that's, that was what I really wanted to write about, that idea of being left behind and the panic of that, but also the loss of someone you're not, even if you, your, your friendship survives in some way, shape or form, it's gonna be different, it's, there's no, no getting around that. You, they're not gonna be the person you come home to, they're not gonna be the one you eat your meals with, the one you go on holiday with, the one you spend Christmas with, this is gonna be the new person, the new favorite. And so it's about, it's about that and that heartbreak. Because mm. I was wondering, when I mean, assuming when obviously when you were writing it, you had you, you would visualize the characters and what they would look like in your own head. But now, when you picture the characters that you created, do you see Holiday and Alia? <laughs> I think I do. Yeah, I think I do. The first time I saw them both, and I was just, I was just blown away by how perfect they both looked for these parts. I mean, Holiday's from Manchester, my hometown, where the book's set. She's from Didsbury. She's got a Manchester accent. She's a redhead. So just like, you are amazing. You're perfect. And she then a bit like Emma. <laughs> oh, in my dreams 20 years ago. But And then Alia, you know, when I saw Alia like this, I was just like, she's more Tyler than Tyler. She's like uber Tyler. This mm. is ridiculous. Mm. So yeah, they were just, just and, and now I think they are set in my head. I think when I read the characters. book, I didn't think, I think Holiday looks a lot like how I would have thought of Laura, but mm -hmm. Alia not not so much but that was what was so exciting about trying to cast those kind of people is like discovering someone like Alia into that role and how much it transformed that role the heart of it's still the same but mm -hmm. it was like well where are we going to push this on mm -hmm. screen what's exciting but yeah. she's got dark curly hair in the book which is so weird because obviously it's not going to always be you know they're not going to look exactly like they're described visually in the book but these they really like felt a, like they yeah, did that's right it was yeah it must be hard because I mean, even when you've got a fantastic director like Sophie on board, you must be so protective <clears> of these characters. And sense it must be quite hard to give them away and say, "This is your story now." Because I guess with any writer, they, they kind of have to do that to a, in a film. They have to give it to the director and say, "This is yours to tell now." But that must be particularly tough when it was based on your own novel as well and characters that you. I mean, it wasn't. It wasn't. It was. Um, I suppose the idea of the abstract idea of that would be, but once I knew Sophie and I knew her work and we just chatted, there was just trust there, and I just knew that. She wasn't going to mess it up. I knew she was going to do a good job. And um, and I was excited and ready for it to take on a new direction because the other thing is I'd started, my head was going on to other things by then anyway. So I, I guess creatively, if that doesn't sound too wanky, I'd sort of left these characters behind a bit. So I was happy to sort of hand them over to new parents for a while and just let's see how they grew um with them with, with that you know also that that complete sense of trust that that this would just this could only be good it would only be excellent 
just a, my very final question, which is, I don't think too about the, what I found the fascinating kind of aspect of this was the drug use in the, in the film, because I remember I watched the Whitney Houston documentary recently, mm -hmm. and I think when I was a kid, I grew up, and sort of, she was almost just vilified as someone, like, just, just this is drug user. Mm, and then yeah. I watched the documentary and realised how easily people can go from just taking it recreationally, socially, to becoming a mm -hmm. drug addict. And, mm -hmm. I was like, and in this, it's a very fascinating thing because they've got that kind of, it's very social, it's very recreational, mm -hmm. but they are on the brink of it becoming a real problem. I was wondering mm -hmm. about tackling that and having it as a contributing factor to a film that is mainly about ro romance and relationships and friendships, mm -hmm. but that's also, in, in some ways, deserving of a film of its own right. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can get stuck in anything. You know, you can get stuck inside the party, which is what's going on for these guys, and that can tip over into some really problematic behaviour and, and things like addiction. Um, you can get stuck in the nine to five, you can get stuck in the wellness routine, you can get stuck anywhere, and those things can always become problematic. Drug taking, yeah, obviously there's things that happen from that, but there are loads of things that go wrong. Um, for me, they are recreational, both of these two. I guess there's a point where they're using drugs and alcohol in a way that is... Um, medicinal in some form, do you know? Um, but we all do that a bit, I think. I really um, was led by Emma, you know, who, who was very keen to not moralise about drug taking and, and certainly drinking, you know, who was very keen to present that, that maybe there was just a roguish fun element to this and that mm -hmm. sometimes it goes a bit far, but maybe you can still pull it back. But so much of the story is about, you know, how do you maintain these elements of yourself without getting lost and swamped in them, yeah. It was very important writing the book and adapting it for me to not make it a cautionary tale in any way. I didn't want it to be a case of, you know, a woman sorts herself out, a messy woman sorts herself out and becomes valuable and lovable because that's a patriarchal storyline and we want to smash that. So at the end, she still pours, you know, a glass of wine. So even though she's sorted herself out, she's kind of, without giving too much away, she's away from other oppressions in her life and is self-liberated. It, it wasn't really about that. The drinking was incidental, it, even though the, the drinking of the drugs is extreme in places, there was also an element of farce for that for me and, and also, um, yeah, towing the line between problematic and, and not, but, but always strictly recreational and not addictive, because I think addiction is a very different thing. Yeah, mm. I'm not judging them, I just want to do invites to their parties. <laughs> 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 no, we do.